excited for this biblical study while living with coronavirus. I've got a few family people in here and it's a chance for us to look together at the study series we've been going through. And the hinge for this series has been what might Jesus have discussed on the road to Damascus on Easter afternoon with Cleopas and his friend when Jesus opened up the Old Testament and used it to explain not only the ministry of Jesus, but, but specifically the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we've been walking through that together, various aspects of the Old Testament that we think Jesus could certainly have used, and we're gonna continue doing that today. Now, this is all in a, you can see I've got all these toys set up here. Uh, these are not toys, but they're sort of, uh, props may be the right word for what we're doing here. But these are important because the series that we've looked at specifically in reference to the tabernacle, which we'll be talking about today, is a series that two weeks ago talked about our cosmic story, where we are with God, where we are with the, the, the cosmos, what it is about women and men that make us unique in this cosmic story. And so our role we looked at two weeks ago, and then last week I taught about how the tabernacle speaks of God and the nature of God and God's specific role in this story. I referenced that the tabernacle is an earthly shadow of a heavenly reality. Found this picture on the internet. This is evidently some famous Caribbean beach where the planes come and soar to land right above the beach. And someone got a good picture of a shadow of the plane coming in. And I like that because the tabernacle that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is an earthly shadow of a heavenly reality. And we need to understand that. And so the way we're gonna do it today is part three in this series. And this is uh, the tabernacle services. In other words, they took this tent and, and enclosure around with them, they being the Israelites. But what happened here? What, what functionally occurred here? That's what we need to discuss today. And, and I suspect the, the fence that went around this was about seven and a half feet tall. It was 10 cubits. A cubit, we don't know with precision, but a cubit was a measurement from the crook of the elbow to the tip of the finger. About 18 inches is our guess. So if this was 10 cubits, it was about a seven and a half feet high fence. And it gets put up immediately. And so I suspect there were a lot of people who were saying, you know, what's going on in there? You know, they, they don't get to see it. And they want to know what's happening in there. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what was happening in there that only a select few got to see and participate in. So I've divided the lesson into three. I like threes. First, we're going to look at the ministry of the priests. What were the priests doing? Then we're going to look at the ministry of the high priest. Because you've got a lot of priests, but you've got one high priest. And then we're going to compare the shadow to the reality. That's our course before us. We'll start with the ministry of the priest. Now, I'd like you to first get oriented to the tabernacle itself. And so if this was a new job, this would be your job orientation. I've got Brent filming this, and I'm going to hold this up like this, Brent, in hopes. Oh, look at that. I think he's zooming in. Um, okay, so here's what we've got here in the tabernacle. This enclosure is built, and the enclosure is a, a, a fence, a screen that sets apart this entire tabernacle, courtyard, and building. And it sets it apart as holy. It's not just part of the common camp of Israel. There's something significant about this. And you've got within this, this altar. And the altar is something that's been built in a very special way to very special measurements for for, for the sacrifice of things to be offered on the altar. You've got tables where lambs are laid in this diorama. 
The lambs aren't always the only thing sacrificed. The opening here to the gate is really interesting. So the opening is just basically about, uh, well, you've got 50 feet across. This is probably about a 25 foot opening. God was very specific about it. But even though the opening is there, there were four posts erected with a fine, uh, um, uh, not garment, but a, a screen set across it so that people couldn't just look in. You had to enter in through the sides here to come in. And then the priests were the ones who would come in and who were allowed in. Now, at the risk of making this a little more difficult to see, I'm going to put it under the Elmo at this point, please, Brent, or the IPVO. And let's uh, pick this up a little bit and see what we can do. So this is the tent of meeting that is inside the tabernacle walls. So this entire setup is the tabernacle. The tent of meeting would be secured on these three sides, but we've only secured it on one so that I can open it up and show you that there is an inner room called the holy place. And this is the room that held the, the candelabra. It held the table for incense and the showbread. And, and this was a place for priests, but inside that was a drapery that would be closed because there was a holy of holies, a kadosh kadosh, something that, that only the high priest would go into and only once a year. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and where the mercy seat was kept. This was where God would meet the high priest, but he would come down, and this was symbolic of how God would see his people. So this whole enclosure was sealed off with its own little um, uh, screen, but this enabled the priest to minister in that special place. So within the confines of this, that's our orientation. And the orientation is such that, that a lot's going to be going on in there. There are going to be sacrifices. There's burning incense. There's placing bread. There's eating bread. There, there's cleaning. There's a lot to be done. And one of the natural questions is God's laying all of this out in front of Moses might be, who gets the job? Whose job is it to sacrifice the animals? Whose job is it to throw the blood around where it needs to be thrown? Whose job is it to light the offerings to the Lord, to burn the incense, to get the incense, to haul the stuff into the tabernacle? Who's got these jobs of serving the Lord? Now, you had 12 tribes of Israel. Those 12 tribes of Israel had a lot of people. But within the confines of that, God said, I'm going to choose out of these Aaron and his sons to do the jobs. So what I'd like to do is look at how they were going to serve. And I'll look at that as the shadow that was given in the Old Testament that we draw a distinction. And at the end, I'm going to look at the reality. So I've put this screen up here, and the screen's got shadow on one side and reality on the other side. And I'm going to be putting in the shadow. Now here's the fun rub for you. What I'd like you to do is try to be guessing as we're going along at what the reality might be. And then at the end of the class, our last point, our last stop, if you will, is reality. And we'll see if you and I came to the same conclusions on that. So with that as background, let's look at the shadows. First of all, what is the job description for these priests? What are they going to do? Well, God told Moses in very specific terms that these priests were supposed to be holy to God. 
That means they are set apart. Holy kadosh means unlike anything else, unique, set apart in a positive way. So these are positively set apart for the ministry and service of God. But they're also intimates to God, supposedly. They're supposed to be. Their calling is to be that way. They were human. And uh, they, they were not all they were. They were not always all they were called to be. But they were called to be intimates to God. This was not drudgery. This was a special blessing to get to serve here. This was a special chance to do things uniquely for the community in a divine way and uniquely for God in a community way. So they're serving as a nexus, if you will. And, and, and that's because they're not just set aside to God, but they're set aside to God's service. They're serving the Lord uniquely behind the walls of this encampment. And so that's the shadow job description. Now, as part of that job description, they were given special clothes to wear, holy clothing. And the, the, God goes to great detail on this. This isn't just kind of like, hey, wear your Sunday best or your Sabbath best. This is something else. This is like really thorough in the description of what they're to do. So we read about it in Exodus chapter 28. In Exodus chapter 28, in verse 2, we read that you, Moses, is going to make sure that holy garments, now again, that word holy, kodesh, those are holy garments, set apart, unique. This is not something you wear any other time. This is something worn fiercely in dedication and service to God. And they're for Aaron, his brother. They're for glory and for beauty. There is glory in presenting yourself to the Lord. There is beauty in presenting yourself for service to God. And that's to be reflected in the clothing that they would wear. Now, this is shadow of a reality. But hold on to that. That that the clothing with which we present ourselves to God is a thing of glory and a thing of beauty. And that's not just for Aaron the high priest. The same was true for his sons later on in the chapter. Verse 40 says, for Aaron's sons, all the other priests, you shall make coats and sashes and caps, and you will make them for glory and beauty. So they're, 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 they're to get these clothes, and they get these clothes, and they get them for glory and beauty. And I mean, the clothes are thorough. I mean, it's got it all the way down to their underwear. You'll make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. So Aaron and his sons, not just outer clothing, but everything with which they're clothed is dedicated to God and his service. And in that, there is glory and there is beauty. And that's the special holy clothing. So if that's our shadow, we'll get to the reality later, but let's look at another shadow. There is special food that they're to have. They've got bread that they're to to make, and this bread is to be set before the Lord, and they're to have this bread. It's still in Exodus 29, verses 32. Starts down here. They've got uh, the flesh of the ram and the bread in the basket in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So remember... You've got the tabernacle here. 
This is the tent of meeting within the tabernacle. In the entrance, that's the outer area, not the Holy of Holies, but in the entrance, they are to have bread. And they have bread for every day of the week. It's a constant source of nourishment before the Lord. So they shall eat those things with which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration, but an outsider shall not eat of them because they're holy. And any of the flesh for the ordination or the bread that remains until the morning, they have to burn because you, you participate in the moment, but you don't leave it as a leftover. Everything is fresh with God. It's not a, it's not a, a gee, stick it in the fridge and we'll pull it out tomorrow type thing. Uh, I've tried to use this as an explanation to my sweet wife, Becky, that leftovers are not necessarily always a good thing, but she says that I've taken the scripture out of context. I think she's right. But the bottom line is there is special food that these priests, not just there, but the showbread that they would have, not just at their consecration, but all the time in service to the Lord, there is set aside special food. Now, for the priests to participate, however, before the priests do it, there has to be an anointing of the priest. The priests have an anointing, and, and the anointing is a process. Before they anoint or pour oil on the priest, they first have to take a bath. They got to get wet. They've got to wash themselves clean. It's in Exodus 29, verse 4, these instructions God gave. This is the section on consecrating the priest. And, and Moses is told, you'll bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. And that's where they start. And then he goes on further and he says, not only will you wash them with water, and then you dress them, and when you dress them, you take the anointing oil and you pour it on his head and you anoint him. And so you have this anointing. Now, what, what is God doing here? God is making these priests his holy servants. By the way, the Hebrew word for priest, Cohen. Cohen, but I've got a friend, David Cohen, who's a lawyer up in Cleveland, and his name retains the fact that he is a Jew who has descended from the priestly line. Cohen is the way we say it in English, but Cohen in Hebrew is the word for priest. So these are the priests. These are those who are dedicated to the Lord and they have to have, let's go back to the PowerPoint if we can, Brent. They have to have themselves washed clean before they get anointed. And then when they get anointed, God pours on them Messiah oil. Say, wait, Messiah oil? Yeah, look back at verse seven. You shall take the anointing oil. Now there's a Hebrew word behind that English word. And the Hebrew word for anointing is Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew. Mashiach. It's Messiah. I think I left out a yod. My Hebrew spelling's weak, but the word is right. Mashiach. This is the Messiah oil. Messiah just means anointing. Jesus the Messiah is the anointed one. But they are anointed priests. They poured Messiah oil on the priest. So after, if we go back to the PowerPoint, after we get the Messiah oil, 
Then there's sacrificial blood that the priests are to put on themselves and on the altar. And this is Exodus 29, again, still the same chapter dealing with the service before the Lord. But now we've made it down to about verse 40. And in verse 38, let's get at the start of the paragraph. This is what you'll offer on the altar. Offer two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, one lamb you offer at twilight. With the first lamb, you've got the, the flour mingled uh, with oil and, and wine for a drink offering. The other lamb, they do much the same thing. But he says, it shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the meeting before the Lord, before the tent of meeting. So at the entrance, and that's this rounded thing here represented in the diorama, they would sacrifice the lambs. And that was to be done routinely for Israel, for the duration of the shadows, until it becomes a reality. And I'm, I haven't given you the reality yet, but... It doesn't take too much to remember John constantly, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God. So God says, this lamb's going to be sacrificed at the entrance of the tent of meeting where I'll meet with you, where I'll speak to you. That's where I'll meet with the people of Israel. And it's going to be washed sanctified, kadosh, made holy. It's going to be made holy by my glory. And that's what God says he's going to do. So the, the, the bottom line of this meeting place is it is a place where God says, I will dwell among the people of Israel, whoops, and be their God. And they shall know that I am Yahweh, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh, their God. That's the declaration. And that declaration is being made within the confines of this service by the sacrifice of a lamb. And that's part of the service of what goes on. And so if we go back to the PowerPoint, these priests who are holy to God, who have sacrificed blood. Oh, and, and if I kept reading, you'd see they put the blood on the ear of the high priest. They put it, uh, uh, sprinkle it on the altar. They dedicate through the blood on the people and on the altar. They dedicate themselves to God. And so that we've got as well. And that's the bottom line. These priests are in service to God to meet God in the holy place in ways that are, are symbols of a greater reality to come. And that's the ministry of the priests, the sons of Aaron, the Kohens. But in addition to that, the high priest himself had very particular uh, uh, responsibilities and authority. And so I want to let's look at the high priest for a moment and consider what's there on behalf of the high priest. Now, first of all, the high priest didn't, didn't just wear special clothes. The high priest got extra special clothes. So in, his, in, in Exodus chapter 28... When the garments are being discussed, the garments for the high priest are extra special. There was someone who was going to, that God filled with the spirit of skill to make Aaron's garments to consecrate him as the high priest. And these are the garments that the high priest uniquely got. He got a breast piece covering over his chest an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work. What's the 
people who make the checkered uh, McKinsey Childs. This could have been like a McKinsey Childs coat, a turban, a sash. They're going to make holy garments for Aaron and for his sons, but Aaron himself gets these unique pieces of clothing. And they're unique all the way down to his turban he got. He got a really cool turban. Verse 36. And on that turban, he, it, there's a plate of pure gold and engraved on it is holy to the Lord. Kadosh to Yahweh. And it's fastened on the turban by a cord of blue. And it's got to be on the front of the turban. See, so he's got this turban. And don't put it on the side. Don't put it behind him. But put holy to the Lord on the front. And it's on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron will bear any guilt from the holy things that the people consecrate. And it's regularly on his forehead that they can be accepted before the Lord. So when he comes into the Lord, it is apparent to everyone that he comes in dedicated to God. His, his appearance is geared towards what God would see. And how he appears to God makes a difference. And God selected him and made him high priest and said he's to be dressed this way because how the high priest appears to God makes a difference in whether or not the high priest is properly bearing the guilt of the people. And so he's got these special clothes. See, what he was doing, he's not just wearing special clothes, but it's like he's got a power of attorney. He represents other people. He's there on behalf of other people. And so you look at it in Exodus 28, 29, or yes, 28, 29. When Aaron goes in, look what he does. Aaron bears the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of judgment, mishpat, on his heart. When he goes into the holy place to bring them, the people, to regular remembrance before the Lord. So Aaron is going in as the high priest, as a representative of the people. And he goes in to represent the people. He's fiercely dedicated. He is only there to serve God. And that's what he does. So now, if we go back to the PowerPoint, he's there on behalf of others. And once a year, the high priest has a special atoning ministry. Once a year, and this is detailed in Leviticus 16. Yom Kippur is what it is called in kind of an anglicized Hebrew. Um, the Day of Atonement. Yom means day. Kippur. Is, is atonement. Uh, it's the same root as the word for the mercy seat uh, that is over the altar, I mean over the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant. And so this is the day of atonement. This is Yom Kippur. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two sons of Aaron. Uh, that's another story for another class, Nadab and Abihu. And he says, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that's on the ark, that he may not die. But he does come on the day of atonement. And when he comes, without going into the detail of that in the interest of time, you can read it yourself in Leviticus 16. But he comes in and the first time he takes the blood of a bull and he seven times sprinkles it on the Holy of Holies contained mercy seat. But before he sprinkles on the mercy seat, he's got to first sprinkle on himself. So the blood of the bull is to cleanse, and he does it seven times. In fact, if you read the, 
the Hebrew rabbis' writings from the time of Jesus. They talked about how the high priest would go in and do this, and he'd do it out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Because he'd want the people to hear that he was doing it, and he didn't want to lose count. David and I were talking about this, and David said to me, he says, you know, there's always one heckler who'd be standing outside the tent going, three, nine, just trying to throw him off. Probably true. But regardless, you, you've got him, and seven times he gets the blood on him, and then he's deemed clean to go in and to put the blood on the mercy seat. To cleanse the people. And that happens once a year on the Day of Atonement to atone for the sin of the people. Now, if we've done this right and we've looked at the ministry of the priest and the ministry of the high priest, then in the shadows that I've talked about, we ought to be able to find some reality. But I'm going to flip them. I'm going to do the high priest first, and then we'll do the common priests. So these slides have a little bit of a reverse order. You'll just have to bear with me. Extra special clothes. Think about the perfection of Jesus. Think about the fact that Jesus was without blemish. Jesus is not a question as a high priest of being someone who who has to sprinkle blood on himself to make himself clean. Jesus doesn't have to wear special clothes to show he's dedicated to God. He's perfect. He's fully dedicated to God. Jesus is our high priest. And all of those things that, that the high priest endured and went through and instructions find fulfillment in Jesus. You know, the high priest went in on behalf of others. Jesus has gone before the presence of God as our high priest on our behalf. Jesus is not there for Jesus' behalf. Jesus was already with God. Paul says in Philippians, when he's talking about how important it is that we have humility, he uses Jesus as an example. And he starts it out in chapter 2, verse 5 telling us to have the same attitude of Christ who was in the form of God before he empties himself and takes the form of a human. So Jesus isn't, isn't there on his own behalf. He's not coming before God on Jesus' behalf. Jesus is God. But Jesus comes before God on our behalf. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5. The writer of Hebrews says, Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to, be ha to act on behalf of men in relation to God. Okay, that's true. The high priest is there to service and, and minister on behalf of the people. He's there to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward because he's a human beset with weakness. But because of this, every human high priest is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins. Just as he does those of the people. This is the way it was with Aaron. But Christ didn't exalt himself to be made a high priest. He was appointed as one. God said, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we'll talk next week about Melchizedek. But Melchizedek is a priest of a higher order than anything Moses and Aaron and his sons did. Remember, Melchizedek has Abraham come and bow before him. And within the loins of Abraham is every Jew. So the priesthood of Aaron, the priesthood of the, the Cohens, all of those priesthoods are within Abraham when he bows to Jesus. Because Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a greater priesthood. So Jesus as the perfect one, he's there on our behalf. And of course, 
the special atoning ministry of the Day of Atonement, the once a year event, Jesus does that, did that once for all. Doesn't have to be repeated every year. The shadow needed to be repeated. Don't lose track of the shadow. But the reality doesn't need to be repeated. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. It explains why. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, through the greater and more perfect tent, not one made with hands, but a greater and more perfect tent, not the shadow, the reality, a greater and more perfect tent, not anything that's of this creation, not goat skins, not anything worldly. Jesus entered once for all into the real holy places, not the shadow, the reality, the real holy places, and not by means of the blood of a goat or a calf, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. See, if the blood of bulls and goats and sprinkling of defiled people with ashes of a heifer sanctify for purifying their flesh, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, the anointed one, through the eternal spirit who offered himself without blemish to God. How much more will that blood purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's what we do. We serve the living God. And why is that? Because if we go back to the PowerPoint, he's the high priest. But we are a priesthood of believers. None of us are outside the meeting place of God looking in. All of us are priests, holy to God. All of his children are set aside for his service. All of us are called to be intimates with God when we're called into a relationship with him. All of us are a chosen, priesthood. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2.9. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. In other words, we're not just priests to some low-life God. We're priests to the King of kings, the Lord of lords. We're royal priests. We're a holy nation. We're set apart. Now, Peter's not writing to the Jews here. He's writing to the believers in Jesus, be they Jew or Gentile. Because we make up the kingdom of God. We are a people for his possession. We are a holy nation, Kadosh. And it's not simply so we can go into a tabernacle and, and talk about what it's like to be in the club. We're there. We are holy, we are priests, we are royalty, we are chosen, we are God's possession so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I want to tell you why I'm doing this right now. I am filming this on a Tuesday at lunch hour. I had conferences all morning at work. I've got conferences all afternoon. I've got enough emails to sink a battleship. But I want to carve out this time because I, like you, if you're watching this and believe in the Lord Jesus, am a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, who has an opportunity to proclaim the excellencies of him who called me out of my darkness into his marvelous light.
And I want to proclaim those excellencies to you. I want you to proclaim those excellencies to the world. And you do it not just with your voice, but you do it with how you live. You do it when you model humility, the attitude of Christ. You do it when you care for the least of these, the attitude of Christ. You do it in private devotion before Lord, the Lord in the practice of Christ. That's what we do. And you say, well, yeah, but is there more? Yes, special holy clothing. Paul says in Romans, but also Galatians 3.27, as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that word put on is the verb for putting on a garment. Whoops. It's, it's, it's clothed in Christ. We put on Christ from the skivvies all the way to the outer clothing. My buddy Don Finto said he likes that because he likes the image he said of the idea of God looking down and he doesn't just see me, he sees my clothing. He says, oh, son of God, I see your clothes. We are specially clothed, and remember the clothing, to the glory and beauty of God. When people see Jesus in us, when we wear Jesus, it's a thing of glory and a thing of beauty. Not to our glory, to his. You can take the ugliest person in the world and put Jesus on them. And they're beautiful. Because any skin deep beauty is irrelevant compared to the glories of God. Okay, we've got to hurry. Special food. Paul said to the, Galatia, or to the Corinthians, the cup of blessing we bless, isn't it a participation in the blood of Christ, the bread we break? Isn't it a participation in the body of Christ? There's one bread. We who are many are one body. We all partake of one bread. As priests, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you choose to call it. We do participate in the food before the Lord. But before any of that stuff's to happen, there needs to be a required anointing. We need the Messiah oil on us. We need what Paul said in Romans, to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, to believe in our heart God raised him from the dead. We need to come before him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Hanenu Elohim. Have mercy on me, Lord. And all of this is part and parcel of us being washed clean. Being clothed in Christ, being anointed, being washed clean. We were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus, Messiah, anointed. And by the Spirit of our God. And that's the Messiah oil. I love the passage, Pastor David reminded me of it this morning. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the Messiah, in the oil. Our Lord Jesus Messiah has blessed us in the Messiah with, and Paul just starts listing a litany of blessings. I think there are seven. Nice divine number. One of which is the sacrificial blood that was sprinkled on the altar for, and the priests. Instead, Ephesians 1, 7, one of the blessings in Christ, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The beauty of this is, is God doesn't merely call us to be his priests, but he's been the high priest first. He has gone in front of us. He has destroyed any barrier that exists between us and God. He has taken care of our sins once and for all and called us to be his priests, called us to be his intimates, called us to be in service of the heavenly kingdom and the heavenly reality. And in that way, bring glory to him among the world and show his light in the darkness. 
And that starts with us because we've been redeemed and we've been made clean. But it's what that frees us up to do that is so critical. Now, I'm dying to talk about this some more, so we're going to do it next week. We're going to talk about Melchizedek. But in the meantime, if you've watched this through, thank you. May God bless you. I want to pray over you. But you also always feel free to email us for any of the content or any of the stuff we do. Um, it is our honor to get to give it to you. It is our honor to get to pray for you. The want more at biblical-literacy.org website gets you on our email announcements, my videos uh, that I try to do each day, video thought for the day. And you're welcome to join that too. Let me bless you in the name of Jesus. Father. We gather together as priests before you, confessing ourselves as sinners and yet at the same time, Lord, living under the anointing and the forgiveness from the blood of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, to bless this message and charge us with excitement over getting to shine your light into a world of darkness as your priests your intimates, those called to your service. Through our high priest, the sacrificing one, Jesus, we pray. So be it. Amen. Amen.